Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Katie, alcoholic. God, I'm so grateful to be here. I, uh, you know, when Polly asked me to come and speak, that coffee's coming, right, Lee? Okay. Uh... (laughs) He promised me coffee. God love him. I am already jacked, but um, when Polly asked me to come here, it was so funny, our conversation. I will leave a little bit of that conversation just between she and I. But, uh, you know, uh, a lot of us get the privilege of doing a lot of these, and, and there's a lot of these conferences that go on, and this one is a very special one. And uh, I said, oh, Polly, man, I am, I'm, you know, three weeks ahead, I'm out of town, I'm at, uh, you know, yada, 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 and she's like, please, how can you say no to Polly? You ever tried to say no to Polly? Oh, no, she, she doesn't hear it. She's not, she not even thinking about hearing it. You know what I mean? You can try, you can try, but she ain't hearing it. And I was like, fine, 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 fine. Because it's a huge honor. Don't get me wrong. But then there's sometimes, you know, you go, oh, my God, that has me traveling six weekends in a row. And uh, because I love Polly, so then I brought all my cronies. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's how that deal works. I go, hey, come with me. And, and I brought my sponsor. Let's have a moment of silence for my sponsor. I'm telling you, she needs it. She needs it. There's been a lineup of great speakers, several I know and several I'm just meeting. And, oh, my gosh, I'm telling you, this is, this is a powerhouse weekend. I, I'm, I'm crazy about the format. I like the format because I like talking about the steps. I, I like talking about recovery. I like talking about getting better. I don't, uh, you know, that, that's, my, that's, my, that's my deal. I'm crazy about Lee and Lee's tapes and his family and his new girlfriend that we met 10 years ago. I swear, when Lee introduced her to me, I was like, now there, that's, we're talking business, mister. And, and need I say, he picked a girl from Texas. Okay, I'm just saying. Just saying, just saying. Just saying. You know, I am from the great state of Texas and proud of it. Uh, you know, it's funny being at a woman's conference. You can, we, 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 we can just get down and dirty. You know, that's part about, oh, I love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. I love being a woman. And, uh, and you know, sometimes boys, when they get crude, there's a difference between crude and down and dirty. Are you with me on that? And I was at a conference not too long ago and I had, you know, I, I, I'm about, I'm about this. I'm about how it looks. You know, I like the way I look. It makes me feel good. And it's, if it bothers you, well, that's your problem, not mine. You know what I mean? I mean, I, I like the way I look. And, and, uh, and I got up there at a conference and my underwear were just jacked. I mean, they were just all jacked. I wore in the wrong underwear. It was a big problem for me right at that moment. And I just turned around and it was a man cheering and I said, oh, I wore the wrong underwear. And I swear he looked at me and he's like, huh? <laughs> I swear, he, he, and I thought, never mind, never mind, we'll get on with this deal. I told, uh, uh, I told Polly, I said, Polly, can you get me a double bed? I'm bringing my sponsor with me. And, and, and I know, you know, I, I know that these things are, there's so much going on. And the last thing she needs on her list is worrying about getting Katie a double bed. You know what I mean? And uh, she, so I texted her, you know, can you get me a double bed? Because we got, we got you a king. I can't really guarantee that. So when we get here, I'm thinking, oh, she goes, we got you a double bed. So I'm thinking, oh, good, good. So when we get here, we get to the counter, and the guy says, uh, I have you and a king. And I said, oh, we were supposed to get a double bed. And he goes, it is a suite. And I went, king will be fine. King, <laughs> king is totally fine. If that is a suite you got me in, I ain't giving up. So I looked at Marty, and I said, you know, I sleep naked. So there, there you have it. And there, there ain't no t-shirts or no nothing. And last night, Marty said, Marty and I, well, you can, you, you can see both of us. She is, she's, she's at Ann Taylor and I'm at BB. Okay. You, and Marty's got her silk jammies on, you know, and I'm just naked. 
a little bit of June Cleaver and Cher, you know what I mean? Actually, I should say Jackie O. She's, a, she's more of a Jackie O. Uh, and I'm crazy about her. Okay, let's get started. I got... <laughs> I have, I've looked through this talk, and it's going to take about two hours, so just bear with me. My, my home group is the primary purpose group. We study the big book line by line, uh, week after week, and it's a lot more fun than it sounds. It really is. We, we, uh, you know, there was a time in my sobriety that that would not have appealed to me. I mean, I was all about the big book. It's great. It's groovy, but uh, let's move on. You know, it was, uh, to me, it was a bit elementary. And it didn't make a lot of sense. You know, it's like, I mean, really, the jaywalker? Who's that stupid? You know? And, you know, and then it, Bill, I felt like I was sitting there talking to my grandfather. You know what I mean? World War I, and the man drinketh the one smallest beer, you know? <laughs> Whatever. Uh, you know, and so I, I, did, I did not relate to the big book at all. And, and today we study the big book. That's been my home group for eight and a half years. We study the big book... Uh, uh, every Tuesday night at 7.30 at Faith United Methodist Church in, in Austin, Texas. If you're there, we'd love to have you. And we have 225 people at that meeting every week. Yeah. So I, uh, you bet. You bet your ass, man. I say, I say the big book's making a big splash back in AA. And, and, uh, but, uh, and, you know, my, my buddy Bill Cleveland says something interesting. He said, when did studying the big book become right wing? You know what I mean? Uh, but uh, so call it whatever you want. To. It has really changed my life and saved my life because at the time I needed some serious life saving. Uh, I'm uh, I'm 56 years old. I got sober when I was 26 years old, uh, October 28th, 1984, and I was in the fitness business for 30 years, and it's done well for me. You know what I mean? I retired about three years ago, and and I'll be in the gym in the morning, and I'll be dragging my sponsor's butt, who is complaining the whole way, uh, to the gym. Marty's like. We, we going now? Because you got a small window if you want me to go. Um, come on. Come on with me. Come on. Complain all the way. Get her on the treadmill. She goes, is there any cool down? Do we have any moment of cool? Mm, I have three grandchildren, uh, seven years old, three years old, and two and a half. And I don't know about you, but grandbabies are, they're God's do-over, aren't they? Yeah, they're, they're God's do-over. I'm telling you, they are absolutely crazy about Graham. I picked my own name, by the way. And, uh, oh, we went through a whole gamut of names, and, 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 and my husband was just giving me such grief, and he is Big Paw, except the youngest keeps calling him Poo Paw. I'm like, yeah, that's old Poo Paw. He goes, stop encouraging that, Katie. Poo Paw, Poo Paw. <laughs> oh, but, you know, the, the oldest grandson, I, I, I love this. You know, he'll go, Graham, can I have a popsicle before dinner? I'm like, have three. I don't care. <laughs> Run with the scissors, man. Have fun. <laughs> Watch SpongeBob all day. <laughs> Whatever a SpongeBob is. Uh, I sat down and watched that for about ten minutes, and I thought, whatever. I mean, get, me, get me some coyote. You know, I got that one better. I, uh, oh, and my buddy Doug. I haven't said hi to Doug over there. I gotta give you a big squeeze. I, I, if I'd have known Doug was gonna be here, I'd have brought Charlie. Of course, Charlie would not know how to handle this many women, so he, he, he barely can handle me. You know what I mean? He, he's a, he's a funny guy. He says, uh, he says, uh, listening to me is a little bit like taking a drink out of a fire hose. You know, you get, get a little bit more than you were expecting. Uh, you know, <clears throat> I, I am, a, a, you know, I, I really understand today that I am, I am merely the vessel to help you get connected to the power. I am not the power. I don't ever want to be the power. I want to be the vessel that can help you get connected. I have a message of depth and weight today, and I'm armed with the facts about myself. There was a time in my sobriety I wasn't, and there's nothing wrong with that. How do you know what you don't know? I didn't know that what I was doing was called meeting-based sobriety. After I got sober in early sobriety, after about the first three years, I was kind of like, what is this? all about. I missed the entire root of my problem. I thought my problem was alcohol. My problem was not selfishness and self-centeredness. I, I could look at Charlie. He was my best friend before he became my husband. I could look at Charlie and see an extreme example of self-will run riot. Oh my God. He was the guy who married, not only dated, but married 
the crazy women in AA. You know that you know how the, you know who those are, right? And and you know I offended some girl in Canada with that statement. I went, chick, man, there are crazy men and crazy women. We are an interesting lot of people. Yeah. A bed of mental health here is what we are, yeah? Now, come on. It wasn't like we walked into the PTA, you know? God almighty. And, you know, I mean, there's help for them, too. Just don't procreate with them, you know? Don't. Good God, you want to hitch your wagon? But Charlie hitched his wagon. And, uh, and, and he was, it was so easy to see selfishness and self-centeredness in Charlie. And there was a moment there that I remember clearly when I said, I don't have it. I don't have self. I'm a giver. <laughs> You'll soon see how much I can give. <laughs> and, uh, and so that's what, you know, Polly says, Katie, I need you to, you know, I want you. It was so funny when she was asking me. I was like, oh, okay, yes, I really want to do it. I just wanted it to fall in a certain time, you know, to work with my schedule. And, uh, and, and, and I swear I had that voice in my head where I said, I hope she's not going to ask me to do six and seven. And she goes, I'm going to need you to do six and seven. <laughs> so I am, I am the queen of self-seeking. Some people call it manipulative. <laughs> the, that is not what the book calls it. The book calls it a self-seeker, even when trying to be kind. And um, so I decide to undermine Polly... By going straight to Lee. Mm -hmm. yeah. I know where that bread is buttered. And I said, Lee, look, you know, Polly wants me to do six and seven, and I really, I do, I do a better three. I do a better three, so, you know, I think I should do a three, and blah, 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 blah. And, and then Lee's like, he goes, he, this, I love Lee. He goes, oh, you'll butcher six and seven, Katie. And I'm like, I know, I know I will. It's a hard step to talk on. And so, next thing I know, I come walking out, and I don't know if you know Mike Lorenz. I sit down with Lorenz, and I said, well, Lorenz, I just got out of six and seven. And he goes, God, that's such a shame. I wonder what God had planned for you. <laughs> so I get up, and now I have become a producer of confusion rather than harmony. Because now i got to go back into Lee and try to get him off my team. Because now he's on my team. See, now I don't want you on my team. Oh, off my team, off my team. Give me six and seven back. No, 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 you're not getting six and seven back. Uh, yes, I got to have it back. Got oh, so then I got to call Polly, and I got to tell Polly I have jacked this whole thing up, okay? <laughs> Welcome to alcoholism. <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm just saying, man. Yeah. yeah, so... My experience in it coming up on my 30th year of sobriety <laughs> is that on a daily basis, I must be always looking at my selfishness and self-centeredness, and it manifests in million different ways. I believe the longer you're sober, your, your ego, like mine, is like a shapeshifter. I mean, I don't know if any of you guys have ever watched True Blood. I hope you do. First, first movie that is racy with attractive men. Um, but the shapeshifter is the, is the guy who can turn into an owl or a dog or whatever, right? And, and that's what my ego does. See, I'm over here looking for the way Katie, how self manifests in a certain way, and a bird flies by and I go, oh, uh, that's, not, that's not it. <laughs> See, my ego is trying to kill me, but it will take me drunk. And I am never safe and protected unless I am diligently working these disciplined steps of 10 and 11. And so six falls right in the middle of it. So the truth of the matter is, is I'm going to give you a little overview. Now, remember, I worked a program based on the abstinence of alcohol for 17 years. Oh, that's not unusual in the rooms of alcoholics and alcohol. <laughs> I heard the wows, but uh, hello. Go to any open discussion meeting and you'll hear it loud and clear. You know, it's my divorce, it's my dead cat, it's my ex-husband, it's my children, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a. And you know, the book says we may be somewhat at fault, but we are sure others are more to blame. That's about as far as most of us ever get. <laughs> column two. Man, I could write column two right here. There's a couple of y'all out there already bugging the crap out of me. You know what I mean? So, uh, 
and, and so the sixth step. The sixth step is difficult to talk on because it is experiential. The book has clear-cut directions. Dr. Bob said it the best. He said everybody in Alcoholics Anonymous will have a different experience. Period. That's why our stories are so important. But the directions are clear-cut. Please don't deviate from them. They were never, thank you, God, and I love Betty Ochoa. Just make out with her right now. <laughs> love her. Uh, I do, I just love her. Um, okay, back to me. So, I almost forgot. I almost gave it to you there, Patty. So, but here's the deal. is is I was, you know, the longer I was sober, I was like, you know, I needed, I needed this and I needed that and I needed that. And don't get me wrong, seeking is a good thing. But the directions in the big book are about treating alcoholism. That's what I suffer from. I don't suffer from anything other than alcoholism. Oh, I may overeat, I may overexercise, I may overwork, I may overspend. Those are just different maladies that pop up when you move alcohol off the table. I believe there's every answer to every problem I have is in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. That doesn't mean I don't get to get a little extra outside somewhere. But that was my experience, and I did a ton of extra outside, and I got myself pretty crazy behind it. Uh, there was also a time, and, and please hear this with an open mind, there was also a time that I used the 12 and 12 a lot. I used the 12 and 12 a lot because I didn't study the big book. And the 12 and 12 to me is an easy read. It's a bit emotional. It's an easy read. And it's just kind of somebody talking about he, explaining things better than the jaywalker. You know what I mean? And, and, I, and I liked it. However, what I realized is when I became a part of this big book group, I went, oh, my God. The big book lays it out beautifully when studied. Not read, but studied. And then I began to understand, and I began to make it smaller and smaller and smaller. There would have been a time the only way I could give a talk on 6 and 7 is I'd have to have the 12 and 12. I would have had to have read the 6 and 7 step in the 12 and 12, because I wouldn't have really got it. Today, well, you be the judge. And trust me, if you disagree, just write inventory. Don't need to come talk to me. Oh. Remember, that line there is to thank the speaker. Thank the speaker line. That is not the line to take issue with. That's the beauty of the process. Okay, so. The sixth step talks about being objectionable. And i got to tell you guys, the word objectionable is a huge word. There are people in this world that do behavior that is objectionable to me. That will not do me any good at changing you. It will get me to get to that love and tolerance. But it will not get you to change. It has to become objectionable to you before we have a piece of business with God. And most of us go through life trimming the branches off the tree. We never get down to the root cause. And so it's, uh, it's also about the willingness to let God change in me however he sees fit. And trust me, that is not an easy task. We can come to these things in, the, in, in these events, which is wonderful. We can feel the presence of God. And in about three days, we get back into our life, and it's my life as usual. And, and that's the one thing that God's saying, I tr I'm trying to get you in the lifeboat. Stay in the lifeboat. No fighting in the lifeboat. Oh! I mean, how, I mean really, have you written a, a plenty of inventory on AA members? I've written more inventory on AA members than I have my own family. You know what I mean? Oh, uh, there's old big head Doug bugs the crap out of me. Oh, my God. And, uh, and then the other part of the sixth step is the lack of power, right? I can't wish it away or think it away no matter how hard I try. The other speakers have done a fabulous job up to six and seven, but I am going to recap a bit of what they're saying because six and seven lies in the middle of. You can't just pluck a step out without discussing what we're looking for. The third step says, I'm almost always in collision with somebody or something, even though my motives are good. See, most of us come to Alcoholics Anonymous, and we're, 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 we're problems. You know, we, we're just learning not to cuss in public. You know what I mean? We're, we're, trying, we're trying not to be the person in the, in the ten-aisle ten lane at the grocery store going, Hey, yo, buddy, that's 12 items right there. We're trying not to be the sheriff of the world. And, uh, but then we come with this kind motive, right? So I'll let you in in traffic. 
but you really better give me one of these. I'll, I'll hold the door open for you. You dang sure better thank me. If you don't, I'll find you in the store and trip you. See, so that's kind of, that's how this deal behind that kind motive is what we need to start waking up to, right? And then the tenth step says, we cease fighting anything or anyone. Position of neutrality, safe and protected. Do nothing. How many of y'all got that on your resume? I'm a do-nothing girl. I just sit back and watch the world go by. I, w I wear life like a loose garment. Oh, my God. I'm telling you. There was some sort of binging and noise over here. I felt like I needed to go talk to maintenance about. You know what I mean? I'm telling Lee, Lee, I can't hear in the back. We got problems. Okay, we got problems everywhere. You know, come on, Marty, let's get to the gym. Let's go, 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 go. See, I, I, I'm a girl that gets it done. I am, I am the, I, I am, I'm, I'm like on a short chain kind of girl. You gotta. I swear, when there's trouble, people are looking at me going, Katie, Katie. Yeah. Oh, oh. So, do nothing is going to require a ton of work on my part. Ton! I mean, I write inventory frequently. The way self manifests for me is I take a step forward when I get scared. That usually, oh, could you see me and Patty drinking together? Thelma and Louise. I'm telling you, because you scare me bad enough and I'll, I'll just knock you to the floor. And, and here's what's interesting, guys, is when we're, we're talking about this, the way self manifests. That, that's what a, what a beautiful job on four and five. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Uh, I love that. I love that. I missed part of it because it was I was working on this. But you know what I mean. I I was hurrying, but I had to share my blow dryer with my sponsor. Who travels without a blow dryer? I have no idea. And I get the mirror because I'm the speaker. So you go in the other room, and uh, uh, oh my God, I swear, Marty goes. Oh, for God's sakes. I'm like, hey, it's all about me. All about me. And, uh, but, but what a beautiful job that the fourth step is about self-manifested in various ways is what causes my failure. So see, the way I show up, if you show up and you're the personality that wouldn't say peep, I mean, wouldn't say peep if somebody held a gun to you, doesn't make you any less alcoholic than me. It's just the way self manifests. That's the purpose of these steps, to treat my alcoholism. self manifesting in various ways is what causes my failure. I've got to get down to the causes and conditions. And so, so you know, I love it. In the third step, it says, it says uh, that we decide to turn our will and our, our lives over to the care of God. I don't know about you, but when I came in here in this kind of language, I'm like, what the hell? What the hell is a will? You know what I mean? What the hell is a life? I, don't, I didn't get it. I didn't get that it was my thoughts and actions that was so beautifully explained by Michael. I didn't get that. I just thought, yeah, okay, whatever, fine, fine, I'll go with this deal. And it's cause and effect, cause and effect, cause and effect. I didn't understand that. Turns out there's a requirement in the third step. First requirement is I've got to be convinced that any life run on self-will can hardly be a success. I'm sorry, guys. I guarantee you can follow just about any of us around. And I'll show you I'm not convinced. I need to get to the front of that line. Doesn't anybody at that elevator understand that I need to be somewhere in 10 minutes, so I'm just going to kind of weasel my way up to the front of the elevator and stand there, and I'm not going to make any eye contact. See, this is talking about a level of self-will that most of us fall asleep to. I know I did. I fell asleep to how self-centered I really was. It says we're almost always in collision with somebody or something, even though our motives are good. See, I don't realize I have a motive. I don't wake up in the morning and rub my grubby little hands together and figure out who I can screw. You know what I mean? I, uh, I, I don't even realize I have a motive till you piss me off. And now all of a sudden, I, you're bugging me. Why are you bugging me? Well, there's the purpose of the inventory, right? Then, of course, most of us are living in the tenth step, right? And the tenth step is four through nine, but we are living in this watching for resentment, dishonesty, selfishness, and fear. Yes, yes, yes. 
So that's the kind of deal that we're doing. Oh, man, I am burning through this thing. You're going to be proud of me, Lee. Uh-huh. Just, just FYI. Uh, I am. I know Lee's always worried. He even has a sign every once in a while. Time's up. Time's up. Uh, but several of the speakers only went 55 minutes, so really that gives me about an extra 10 minutes. So I get 10 minutes from all of them, so I get an extra 30 minutes. Um, see, that's what I do out there. I am working an angle. So the book talks about me being the actor running the whole show. Once again, another line that never touched me. Of course I'm the actor running the whole show. God knows somebody needs to. You know what I mean? I mean, I am the sheriff of the world. Now, I know you think you are. You are merely the deputy when I'm around. No, I am, I am the end all. I am in the AA world the cleavage police, right? That outfit is unacceptable, Missy, and I'll be the first one to tell you right over there. One girl came up to me at one point. I said, honey, I cannot even hear what you're saying. You have got cleavage this much cleavage. I can see the underside of your bosom. What the heck? And it's not pretty. It's not. Most of it ain't pretty. And then in the grocery store. What am I doing in the grocery store? You know, I mean, I, I come down, somebody just leaves their cart. What? Who does that? Who just leaves their cart? Now, when I leave my cart, I turn around when I realize I've left. I, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I, 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 see, I'm going to explain my motives to you. And I'm going to expect you to forgive me. But when somebody else does it, it's an outrage. <laughs> and who in the world puts the potato chips on the end? Who, who does that? Who makes these aisles so short? Why do we have nine bank teller lines and only one bank teller? <laughs> you can give an alcoholic a $100,000 job in less than six months. We'll figure out how we're getting screwed. That's what we do. The ego of the alcoholic rebuilds in an astonishing rate. The sense of entitlement we have is really shocking. We really do feel that we should be given special treatment. When we get pulled over, I love the whole using our sex powers. When we get pulled over, we should be able to get out of it and get a warning. Mm -hmm. Whenever we, we, we don't do late fees. Don't you know who I am? Yeah, come on. Come on. Just give me another ten minutes with you and I'll wear you down. And then it says, if only my arrangements would stay put, if only people would do as I wished, everybody, including me, would be happy. What's so wrong with that? It's Katie-topia. I mean, come on, you know? I'm telling you, you take my motives and my delusion, you run my actions through it, the least thing I'm going to get is an A-. minus. I mean, come on. And then I got the whole world pissed off at me. See, I don't get this. 61, 62 are so powerful in explaining the many different ways self shows up for us. It's in my DNA, guys. My DNA is not about you. My DNA is about me. Now, I can fake it. I can blend. I blend well. I actually do. You know, it's funny. I just had a, a, a new awakening. Um, this is going to shock you. It really shocked me. I, uh, we were in Louisiana doing Fellowship of the Spirit, and, and uh, we went to this Zydeco breakfast. It was really a fun deal, and the energy was high. You had to wait in line. You know, I don't wait in line, but I waited in line, and, and we get in there, and it's, it's all exciting, and you've got to get a table fast, and da 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 And the, the wait staff, she came over, and I, I just said this. I said, I'll have a cup of coffee, and she goes, oh! And I thought, did I startle you? Oh, my God. I mean, she that was a little overreaction. And then I thought, you know, maybe I startle people. Maybe the world isn't looking at me because I'm so cute. Maybe I'm a lot coming at you. I know. I, I, I knew you'd be shocked. No one. Trust me. So then I'm in the airport last week because it seems we live in the airport. God knows. Oh, you want to you wanna write, write some inventory. Just sit in the airport for a little while. And uh, so I'm in the airport, and I come up behind this man just to get the plastic fork, and he goes, oh. And I said, did I startle you? And he goes, yes. And I said, you know, it's funny. I'm starting to look at this. Of course, way too much information. I, I said, I'm starting to look at this as I think I really do startle people. And he goes, well, you were a bit of a ninja there. He said, yeah. 
thought, oh my God. And then, you know, now I got to be honest with you guys. The book says, some of these we will not give up. I ain't giving that one up. I am not giving that one up. I like that about myself. I like to kind of scare you. So, but I swear I thought, oh my God. And here I thought it's just because I was so cute. So, um, now, here's some terminology that, I, that, that really tripped me up. Uh, I did a ton of counseling. I did codependency recovery therapy, group therapy, for 10 years. I could throw down right here, man. I could throw down and point out every defect of character everybody on that front row had. And walk away unharmed. I mean, it's terrible. And, and, but you know what? I'll tell you. I learned everything you could learn about Katie, but I missed the entire spiritual piece. What do you do with it? You know, I can't wish it away or think it away on my own. And, uh, and so these words, I think, have a tendency to trip us up. Remember, the book, God, the book is so precious. Please, let's all vote never to change the book. Please, please, please. please. Cast your vote. Cast your vote. And, and we use terminology today like this, controlling, manipulative, and expectations, as if I can change those. See, I can't change those. I can't change how controlling I am by being less controlling. The word in the book for controlling is driven. I am driven by fear, right? For manipulative, I am a self-seeker. That's what I do. I get you on my side. I pit allies. I get everybody to do as I wish. And expectations are ambitions, my little plans and designs. And once I can start to put those in the book, the book makes more sense to me. People say that, they're, I love this one, when a sponsor comes to me and says, well, I'm a real people pleaser. I'm like, oh, please, let's bring all the people you have pleased. Let's just line those babies up. Yeah. You are an approval sucker, is what you are. A producer of confusion rather than harmony. And that's what we do. The book says that selfishness and self-centeredness, that we think is the root of our troubles. Wow. See, I always thought it meant stingy and conceited. In Bill's story, it says, take them root and branch. Trimming the branches is mostly what I've ever done is manage. I've tried to manage my defects of character. I was one of the people in the meetings. Oh, my God. I mean, when I was in untreated alcoholism in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, they'd say, anybody have a topic? (laughs) Absolutely. I need to get this show started. Right, man. And we need to be talking about me. And, I mean, I would raise my hand and I would lob it out there and I would say things like, I'm working on my defects. Really? Well, I was right, right in the face of the line that says, uh, I can't wish this selfishness away much on my own power. I can't wish it away or think it away, no matter how hard I tried. Wow. When I read that line, I thought, has that always been in the book? <laughs> it says, I'm driven by those hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, self-pity. We step on the toes of our fellows. That's my husband's toe. And he'll be over there going, God dang, Katie. I'm like, that hurt, huh? 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 Boy, how many many people in here are married? That's pretty good numbers. That's that's impressive. I I said that at one conference, about seven people raised their hand. There you have it. It says, uh, sometimes they hurt us, seeming without provocation, but we invariably, which means always, find that at some time in the past I made a decision based on Katie that later placed me in a position to be hurt. There's, a, there's a, something I like to do about when you're at work. I, we, we love gossip. Come on. I mean, er, human beings love to gossip because it makes me feel good to talk bad about you. And uh, that's what we do. And I'll do it under, you know, and if you're from Texas, you know this. Y'all are from the South. Well, Texas is, by the way, not the South. But, we, we you know, Texas is Texas. I'm sorry. And, and, but, uh, you know, we always say, uh, you know, bless their heart. Bless her heart, she's so stupid. Uh, you know. and, and it seems as if I'm trying to really be kind with it when I say it. But, uh, you know, this is, how, this is how self-centered, how driven by fear so quickly we can be. We can be at work, we're standing at the coffee pot, and we're talking to somebody, right? Just, just say we're talking to Bill. And Bill says uh, something about somebody in the office I don't like. 
And I got a little trash on her. And I tell Bill, and I don't, don't, don't tell anybody I told you that. Now. Right? And when I walk away, I'm a bit remorseful. You know, I, I know I, I probably shouldn't have done that. It's not very spiritual. I dismiss it. Then I see, I look up at my boss's office, and he and Bill are walking out, and they both look over at me, and they go, What the hell was that? What? And then I go, you know what? Bill went and told him what I said about her. And I got it. I am driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion. I know what happened. That's delusional mind is what I got. It's a failure to recognize reality is the definition of delusion. And so then I'm driven. I self-seek. I go straight to Bill and I go, did you tell him what I said about Mary? Now, I don't see that I'm, I, I'm challenging his integrity. I asked him to not tell anybody. So now I'm calling him a big fat liar. And I have stepped on his toes and he's going to retaliate. See, I have no idea what they were talking about. Oh, yes, I do. See, I don't know about you guys, but I have a gift. And I read minds. I do, I do. It's, I don't know how I got it, but I got it. And, uh, and I'm right. Got all kinds of history that shows I'm not, but today I'm right. So it says, so our troubles we think are basically of our own making. If I want to be free, the problem's got to be me. Period. Rarely does somebody do me wrong. I'm just saying. Now I'll tell you, when I am done wrong, that, that particular type of resentment can shut me off from the sunlight of the Spirit faster than any delusional resentment I can have. I, I, until I had it, Charlie's youngest daughter infuriated me, stole some stuff from me, pawned it, melted it down. I could get all of you guys to be my ally. Hold that little girl's head underwater for a little while. Cut off every means of support you got on her. That's not how my husband handled it. So, not to kill him. Uh, and in my prayer and meditation, twice in a seven month period, God quiet, the still quiet voice said, Katie, talk to her. Get to that forgiveness. Talk to her. And this is my, my voice. Hell no. I ain't doing it. I ain't doing it. And uh, when I finally did it, I could not get over how free I was. And I didn't go make amends to her. I told her how badly she upset me and that she makes it darn hard for me to love her. But I can't stop loving her. <sighs> now, Marty's listening to about eight million pieces of inventory on that little piece of work. And uh, says the alcoholic is an extreme example of self-will run riot. And Carrie knows this one, comma, though he usually doesn't think so. Another delusion we live in. So are you an extreme example of self-will run riot? The answer is only yes. I'd love to say I've grown so much spiritually that no, I'm not. Okay. <laughs> I haven't. I have to do these disciplines as if my life depends on it because I have been in those bedevilments. I know that level of pain. I know that I can drift so far that I'm looking around going, where is the land? Anybody's been in the ocean and the undertow has taken you so far, you look around and go, oh, we're in trouble. When, when did that happen? See, that's what the book is. More. It's implying that we're going to live with a level of trouble. Implying, And it doesn't have to be catastrophic. It can be this at work. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. So it says, you know, I kept thinking life was coming at me. It is coming from me. I didn't get that. It says many of us had moral and philosophical convictions galore, but we couldn't live up to them no matter how much we'd like to. Oh my gosh, you guys, when I was in untreated alcoholism, those bedevilments, I, I, I have a value system. We all do, right? These moral and philosophical convictions are my values. And what I didn't realize is, is I have a, I spank my children. You know, you may not. That may not be against your, personally I think you should, but hey, uh, you know, you may not spank your children. 
And, and I spank my kids. I spank them at Disneyland, one arm up and whacking them as... You know what I mean? It's like we are all standing in that line for 45 minutes in July. It's 100 degrees. You mind it or you whack it, buddy. I will whack your butt like crazy. So I'm okay with spanking. But I am not okay with slapping my children in the face. I slapped both my children in the face in sobriety at 10 years. Slapped my daughter and slapped my son. See, in untreated alcoholism, when I'm working a program based on the abstinence of alcohol, I will do everything I did and more without a drink in hand. I will have an affair. Did that. I will do. Every, I will lie. I will cheat. I will steal. And I didn't even know I was capable of doing that because I thought it was all about not drinking. And today I understand, oh my God, I missed so much. See, self can't fix self, guys, and I thought it could. And you did such a beautiful job on four and five. Beautiful job. I, I, I'm a technical girl. I have to be because, remember, I'm the short chain. You know, you got to keep me on a short chain here. And so she did such a beautiful job, I'm going to touch on, you know, this vigorous course of action is what the book talks about. I thought the vigorous course was four and five. See, I thought that this vigorous course was just getting that inventory done and telling somebody about it. It says that first we, we started on a personal house cleaning. We had to get down to the causes and conditions. Column two, column three. Cause and effect. This is all leading up to six and seven. The reason there's only two paragraphs is because all of this work is leading up to it. Didn't get that. I mean, I remember in early sobriety doing six and seven as, yeah, whatever. Okay. You know what I mean? I didn't get it. I just didn't get it. And most people won't get it until it's explained. That's the beauty of why we study the text. And it says we have to get down to those causes. How do I show up? It's an effort to discover the truth about the stock and trade. How do I show up? Self-manifested in various ways is what defeated Katie. How do I show up? See, I know I'm selfish and self-centered. I know as the 12 and 12 says I have seven deadly sins. Big deal. Big deal. Yeah, are you jealous? Yeah. Are you envious? Yeah. How does that show up? See, I, after you've been sober a while, I need a little bit more depth. Because acceptance is the key. Ain't touching me. It ain't touching me. Matter of fact, you can tell me. I cannot. I want to slap your lips off your face right now. Did you, did you not hear my problem? And you're going to give me that hinky little acceptance? And what that is, is it's the promise. So you're trying to get me to the promise, expecting, you know, it worked the promise, it's hoping the steps come true. It doesn't work that way. Don't lob out, turn it over at me. I just told you my problem. And you're giving me the promise. You've got to give me the work. It's a program of action. I can't get there. I can't get bridge to shore, bridge to shore. It says I can't fool myself about values. These old ideas, where do they show up in that third column? Beautiful job. Third column. How does it affect my self-esteem, my pride, my ambition, my security? How? The question how changes the dynamics of that third column. Ask an alcoholic that's never done that, how? You can't answer it. I couldn't. I remember the first day I looked at that and I went, what do you mean How? Surely it must, because it's bugging the crap out of me. But how does it affect your self-esteem, Katie? How do you see yourself in this deal? Oh, well, I'm a good wife. Okay. I'm a good AA. Okay. How about your pride? Nobody should question my program. <laughs> oh, there we go, protecting that self-esteem. Right? And as it goes down, we start to see how this thing is laying out. Then you got the bridge, the sick man prayer, getting me to see it from an entirely different angle. Oh, my God. When I can see the me and you, I can have so much compassion. When I could see that given the circumstances, I possibly could have behaved that same way. See, you hurt, threaten, or interfere with me. The cause and effect is fear and self-will. And the way my self-will shows up is self-righteous. So when I'm talking about this sixth step, you got no idea. When I'm scared bad, back it down, baby, back it down. And I'm sitting in untreated alcoholism. I was married for 20 years to a wonderful man, Joe Gordon. And we had it all. And I chased him into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I sat at his feet where I read the big book. I had 10 minutes sober. He had six years. It was a beautiful match made in heaven. <laughs> And uh, he knew he knew it was all wrong in the beginning, but 
my sex powers. Because I'm good. I still am. And uh, that's what I love about women. We can say that. See, when we're all together, we're not threatened. You stick about 15 men in here and we all get all threatened. See? Oh, we got to bring that into the co-ed action, you know? But, uh, and so, and so Joe, you know, I mean, I'm trying to get Joe into my vortex, you know? Oh, man. My daughter said, Mother, your vortex is scary. You're like going, I'm the and she says, and then you get in there and it's like a spider web. <laughs> you know, once again, not really willing to give that up. And uh, so, um, Marty knows that. We can have another moment of silence for Marty. But, uh, and so this man was wonderful and we, we really, we, we made a commitment. You know, we had another, we had a baby together. I had a five year old and, and we did this deal. We were Mr. and Miss AA. And I fell in love with the fellowship. I mean, it was, it was just wonderful. Then all of a sudden, you know, about, about 15 years into our marriage, he gets sick. He gets really, really sick. Long story short, he is diagnosed with a brain tumor. Now, I have to drive a school bus because I'm a fitness professional, and he is a carpenter, and we're both self-employed. We have catastrophic insurance, and they want him to have all this testing done. So I decide to drive this school bus because, see, I get stuff done. And the school bus, if I drive this school bus, I get an instant HMO, which I'm only going to have for, what, a month max? Then I'm quitting the job when we find out what's wrong with his head. I have no idea he's going to be diagnosed with a gigantic brain tumor. And I'll tell you guys, when you scare me bad enough, Today, I'd like to say I work a much stronger program and the, the reaction wouldn't be as devastating. But what happened was, I'm sitting there, and when the doctor tells me he's got a massive brain tumor, and he puts his hand right here, my very first thought was, I'm going to be driving this school bus for the rest of my life. <laughs> very first thought. See, that's how selfish and self-centered we are. Now, I'm not going to tell anybody that is the, the thought. I didn't look at him and go, great. Now I'm going to be driving that stupid-ass school bus. You know, I know that. But that was, that is, see, I believe that first thought is the tenth step right there. I am watching for resentment, dishonesty, selfishness, and fear, and when these crop up. I'm not responsible for my first thought. I'm, I suffer from alcoholism. I am maladjusted to life. Full flight from reality. Cannot differentiate the true from the false. Thank you very much. I don't know about you, but the first time I heard that, I went, Really? Oh, my God. I thought there was really something wrong with me. But that is encouraging. You know, I don't need no pill. And so, uh, so I am sitting there and, and this is my first thought. Well then, my buddies all come in and the next thing I know, they're saying to me, it, the, the doc comes in, the neurosurgeon. Now this is a part of my story I never really share with anybody, but when he asked me to do six and seven, I, I gotta share it with you. I'm sitting there and the neurosurgeon comes in and looks at me and says, he'll, his brain tumor is so large, he'll never work another day in his life. Now, what happened to me at that moment, I had my best buddy standing, sitting right there, Mike Favella. It felt like I had swallowed a tennis ball. And Mike said, Katie, how do your bills look? I said, Mike, I can't even speak right now. You've got no idea how badly that scares me. See, I'm a fitness professional. I didn't do education because I don't like education. And I ain't doing education, okay? If you want to, you feel like it, you know, your alcoholism robbed you of your education, go get a master's, go get a PhD. I don't give a shit. I don't, it, it doesn't do it for me. I don't like school. And I don't like anything about history. I don't even like Bob Dylan. I mean, I can just go on and on and on and on and on. You know what I'm saying? I, it doesn't do it for me. So I'm uneducated. Now all of a sudden, that just popped up to the surface. I'm uneducated. All I have is my body. And i got to make money. I had just given up 
half of my business because I was going into semi-retirement. So I gave up about $50,000. Now I'm making only $50,000. Now this is 15 years ago. That was a, still a nice living. And all of a sudden, my husband is not going to be working. I got a kid in college. I got one in junior high. I'm in trouble. And I'm telling you what, guys, what I did from that moment on was just unbelievable. I get stuff done. I didn't turn to God. I turned to self-reliance. That's the only tool I got. I left home at 15. I get stuff done. And I threw myself into making more money. And that year I made $100,000 more. I'm good. I'm better than God. And I can get this done. I still love God. I'm bringing God into everything in my life when I see fit. (laughs) But otherwise, I'm not laying down that tool of self-reliance. And I'm telling you guys today what I realized almost died. I stepped on so many toes. My husband was sick for six years. I stepped on so many toes of my fellow. If you get in the way of my money, get out of here. If you get in the way of that, get out of here. And I mean, I just ramrodded past people, and I can do that. The minute I drift from this program, I can do that in a heartbeat. And what I didn't understand was, what did God have in store for me had I turned to God? I didn't have the tools to turn to God. That wasn't even an option. It really wasn't. But what I got was my experience from this. And I'll tell you what happened. My self-reliance went as far as it could go, but it does not solve the fear problem. My husband had 23 years sober and ended up going back out and dying of a heroin overdose. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't fix him. I'm telling you. I went into the darkest days of my life at that point, and I thought, you know what? Everybody could kiss my ass. Sitting in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. Nobody gets it. Made you have to trump me, you know? And I mean, I went so dark, so dark. The book talks about these bedevilments, guys, and we ain't messing around. We ain't messing around one bit at all. I know them by heart, but I'm going to read them. We were having trouble with our personal relationships. We couldn't control our emotional nature. We were prey to misery and depression. We couldn't make a real living. We had a feeling of uselessness. We were full of fear. We were unhappy and we couldn't seem to be a real help to others. There's somebody sitting in the room with the bedevilments all over. Of course you are. You suffer from a disease of alcoholism. We're not lily white. We're not fixed and cured and pat you on the butt and get down the, you know, magic road. And what ended up happening is I I couldn't even water a plant. I love plants. Couldn't walk my dog. Moved into an apartment, didn't see that I needed to walk the damn thing. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it was one of those things where you go, oh, you got to walk your dog if you live in an apartment now. Okay, when did that happen? Three days, three times a day. Had to give my dog to my friend. (laughs) Can't do it. Can't do it. I didn't want to nurture one thing. And I'm telling you what, I, I, God is so wonderful. God is constantly trying to get me in the lifeboat. He is sending me every day, every minute. Wake up. Awaken aware. Turn back to the line. Awaken aware. Turn back to the line. Don't miss anything, Katie. Because when I am awakened, my spirit is awakened. It's not that pretty. Oh, oh, it's, oh no, it's not pretty. I mean, you walk into situations, and it's almost like a, the, the Terminator. You know how he has those things that go, <laughs> you know? And I'm like, you know, God, help me here. Yeah, she, yeah, she scares me. Oh, he pisses me off, and I don't even know him. And, uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> right? And this awaken aware, this turn back to the line, this desperate need for every waking moment of my life to be of God-centered is what the sixth step is talking about. I just gave you all of what it is that leads up to it. And I met a wonderful man. His name was Mark Houston. And I'm telling you what, changed my life. Changed my life. I remember sitting there thinking, what book is he reading out of? I'm 17 years sober. And Charlie, I was with Charlie now. Joe's died. I'm with Charlie. And Charlie leans over and And, uh, oh, no, Charlie's such a suck-up. Oh, he is sucking up to Mark. You know, Mark's giving us this evening review to look at and blah, blah, blah. Not me. And Mark's a man. You know what I'm saying? 
And so uh, the next thing I know, my eyes began to awaken to there was something more here. And then I, I asked my dear friend Marty to sponsor me. And I did not want Marty to sponsor me. God told me three times to use her, and I went, no. I will say no to that still quiet voice, trust me. No, ain't willing to do that. Ain't willing to do that. Not objectionable yet. I hadn't gone far enough down the tubes. And uh, I told Marty, I'll never forget it. I am so miserable. And uh, Joe's been gone 18 months, and I called her, and I said, Marty, I'm, I'm dying. I am dying here. And she was in untreated alcoholism, too. She'll be the first one to tell you. I'm telling you what, don't wait till you got this deal. God's trying to pull both of you into the lifeboat. You know what I mean? God takes up a ton of slack. And she says, I tell her all about, you know, she already knew about Joe, yada, yada, yada. And the next thing I know, she says, you know, honey, I want you to go read in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, <clears throat> pages 60 to 63. And I remembered thinking, well, i got to find my book. <laughs> That's never good. And, uh, and I said, uh, that surely there's got to be a line in the book that talks about some of us have it harder than others. That's what, uh, that's what I'm surely getting ready to read. And I just happened to open it to page 62 that said selfishness and self-centeredness that we think is the root of our trouble. And you see, I'm the girl on the short chain, right? I ain't letting that go. I pick up the phone right away. I'll go, hey, what? Several cuss words later, I said, hey, what is selfishness and self-centeredness, are you kidding me? After what I just told you, this darkness that I'm in? She said, oh, honey, there's a fine line between sorrow and self-pity. And you have drifted into self-pity. And I'm telling you guys at that moment, I, I, I'll love you for the rest of my life. I'll sleep with you naked. I, uh, I, uh, I uh, was so forever grateful for that. And then the book, you know, it goes on. It's this, you know, this swallowing and digesting large chunks of truth about ourselves is what the inventory is. It's not about feeling good. If you walk away from an inventory feeling good, you did it wrong. I'm telling you, you did it wrong. This is not about feeling good. Yeah, people, oh, that'll get you right in inventory of me. Oh, no. The minute my ego thinks that I'm okay, I am in trouble. My God-centered voice is always telling me I'm okay. My ego's trying to kill me but will take me drunk. And I'm telling you guys, I tell you, the, the, the understanding I have today, the way I look at things, the awake and aware, since you've entered into the realm of the Spirit, what does that mean? Today I know what it means. So, lay, you know, lay your own experience up against it. Ask yourself the questions. Do I know what it means? If the answer is no, I don't, there is, there is answers. And it's okay to ask, but your ego says, don't ask anybody. You're fine. So then we go to 6 and 7, because 6 and 7 is in this vigorous course of action, right? So you go home, you do the hour and the fifth step, right? Most people say you go home. I used to say you go home, do 6 and 7. Wrong. You go home and do the hour and the fifth step. It's talking about building this foundation. Joe did not have the foundation. For if an alcoholic failed to enlarge his spiritual life through work and self-sacrifice, he can't handle certain trials and low spots ahead. Thank you. I lived it. You almost lost me. So my children would have been without either parent. My son never saw me drink. But when I was in those bedevilments, in the darkest days of my life, he's 15, he'd open the bedroom door, and he'd go, Mom, are you okay? And I'd say, shut the door! Leave me alone! Mm. Scared the crap out of that kid. I mean, he can't fix me. Mm. See, I'm telling you guys, if you're sitting in some pain, there is so much help for you in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Study the book. Get with somebody who gets the book. Oh. And so, i got to keep moving because i got to get to six and seven. 
You know what? We're here, six and seven, get ready. It just took me an hour. Uh, and I'm going to run a few more minutes. So um, I'm not asking for permission, just want to tell you. And so uh, it says six and seven. It's, it's very simple. So you do the hour and the fifth, right? Now you're going to answer the questions in six, say the prayer in seven, right? The third step, prayer. And I love that we talked about not having an amen. The third step prayer is like the three frogs on a log. Right? There's three frogs on a log. One makes a decision to jump. How many frogs are still there? Three. It was just a decision. The seventh step prayer is the splash. Stole that from Bob Darrell, so I can't take full credit, but I'm never giving him credit again. So, you got to give credit three times and then that's it. Or at least that's what I was told. That's the handbook of speakers. It says, um... We've emphasized willingness as being indispensable. Willingness means to grant the action. See, I didn't know that. I thought willingness, okay, yeah, I'm willing. Okay, fine. I didn't realize it means to grant the action. And indispensable means absolutely necessary. Are we now ready to let God remove from us all things which we've admitted are objectionable? I can tell you the answer is no. I'm tell- Yeah, of course it's no. My ego is my spacesuit. I can't get through life without it. I am not without ego. Have you ever heard this one? I used to say this, leave your ego at the door. How do you do that? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Where's your humility? Well, i got to earn my humility. That's a byproduct of working the steps. Oh, I can act humble, but up here, you can kiss it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, I can show it to you. And so... There, you know, here's just a couple of things just to kind of narrow it down. Is, is um, you know, the, 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 some people don't like cussing. I love it. And uh, I do. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. And I especially love the F word. Now, I know not to use the F word up here. But, uh, but I'll throw out a few dams and, and that and this and that and the other. And, and I'm speaking at Founders Day next week. And they have told me that they are making an exception to my audios. Uh, or, you know, that no cussing. I'm like, fine, nothing. So, uh, but I would never lob out the F word. But I like the F word. I like it. I, I like the way it makes me feel. And sometimes I see a reaction from you that you don't like it. And this is the reaction. Just go through life looking for that reaction. If you don't think you're an extreme example, just watch it. You, know, you, alco- you ask an alcoholic if they're married and 15 minutes later you might get the answer. That's a yes or no question. Okay? And when people ask you how are you, they really don't want to know. Just kind of what we do. So, I like the F word. And so I have noticed that some people are disturbed by it, so I try to tone it down a little bit. And, um, but it's not objectionable to me. It may be objectionable to you. Until it's objectionable to me, i got no piece of business with God in the sixth step. And so Charlie has a business guy come over to the house, and he's from New Jersey. Where's my New Jersey girl that introduced I thought, God love you. And, and I was just recently out in New Jersey, and they love the F word. Oh, I was at home. They love them all. They love the MF and the whole nine yards. You know what I mean? So I'm out there, and, and this guy comes to the house, and I mean, he is lobbing out the F-bomb, and he's lobbing out the MF, and the, the, the GD, and, the, and all of a sudden I thought, well, that, that looks ugly. <laughs> and I had a piece of business with God that very moment. And I said to God, you know what, I don't, don't want to look like that, God. If that's how I look, I don't want to look like that. And I'm telling you what, what that did for me didn't miraculously disappear. Best of luck to you on those defects, but that was not my experience. And what happened was I began to have that moment, pause when agitated or doubtful, ask, remind, and say, there's four things you got to do, not just stop. And, and I realized that I was getting ready to say it, and I said, fiddlesticks, or fudge, because the F was, you know, I was like, blah, blah, blah. right there. And so... And let me tell you, here's the, here's the really cunning, baffling, and powerful part of it. It lasted for about six months. And then something happened. And I just brought it back in. <laughs> so I'm back at, it's back there now. It's back there. We're going to work on it. But, uh, um, you know, I got to, I got to keep moving because I'm, I'm really only got about another hour. So we're going to, I know that. 
So, uh, but the other, you know, here's another one that was moved. Uh, this one was removed instantly from me because it was so painful with snooping. Oh, and I'll tell you with Facebook, you guys, oh, I, I caution you on all telephone problems. <laughs> Facebook and texting, the need to not be able to be present is a huge problem with the alcoholic. Oh, my God. You know, the book talks about this peace of mind we are so desperately seeking. And we can't not play Candy Crusher. You know what I mean? And the problem with Candy Crusher, I challenge you, delete that game immediately. We can't, it's a game you can play for 15 seconds. So you can be, and it's colorful. And we can be out of our heads in a short period of time. I played it for three days and realized I was in big trouble. Big trouble. And, I, and guess when I picked it up? When we were at Charlie's family's house for the holidays. Oh, yeah, I'm picking up Candy Crusher because this is too much. <laughs> they got the whole family together. So I'll just, you know, kill all these little yellow dots and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and then it, it asked me uh, for, to, to pay 99 cents. And I thought, whatever. I ain't paying 99 cents. I keep hitting the button, hitting the button, hitting the button. I thought, what? Put it down. Well, then I pick it back up and play, 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 and then it wants 99 cents again. I don't get that. Then all of a sudden I realized, if you pay the 99 cents, you can keep playing right then. I found myself in three days paying 99 cents. And I heard the still quiet voice go, this is a big problem. <laughs> and I'm telling you what, to give up Candy Crusher after only three days was difficult. I'm just saying. And then the book goes on to say, how can I remove them, every one of them? If we, if, we, if we still cling to something we cannot let go of, we ask God to be willing. Of course you can't let go of everything. The book says on page 66, the more we tried to have our own way, the worse matters got. The victor only seemed to win at war. The word seems is italicized because it's a delusion. And I, this one makes me crazy. When I'm telling you a problem I got, you go, would you rather be right or happy? Both. What a stupid, what a stupid question. Oh, I guess the right answer is happy. I want to be both. And you know what? I can. Because I'll use my sex powers. That's how it works. This is not a secret. You know, I get even, I keep score. That's what I do. I'm telling you, man, you've got to do the work. You've got to get me to see it from a different angle. You've got to get me to see where this person is coming from. It says on page 66, the world and its people really do dominate us. In that state, the wrongdoings of others, fancy the real, had the power to kill. The book warns me, if you're pissed off at anybody, do the work, man. You are in dangerous ground. Page 77, our real purpose is to fit ourselves, to adapt ourselves, to be of maximum service to God and the people around us. We are, in, we are here to play the role God assigned us. That is difficult. Don't take that as it's just being nice. I'm in constant collision, even though my motives are good. And then the, the, the um, seven-step prayer is fabulous. I'm only going about three more minutes. Hang in there. I know. He's over there looking at me, isn't he? It's okay. I'm not looking at him now. And so, and then, of course, the vigorous course of action, right? You can't just pluck six and seven out of the deal. The reason six and seven is only two paragraphs is because we just did all this work leading up to it. We just discussed the third step. We looked for it in the fourth and fifth step. We sat in an hour in the fifth step. We took these things to God. Now is the magic, eight and nine. Eight and nine is the magic. Don't cheat yourself. Don't let anybody in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous tell you you don't need to make that amends. That is baloney. Now, unless, unless it's an affair with a married man, and you're going back to him, and the ex-wife knows, or the wife, if she stayed, God love her, that ain't me, but, uh, oh no, that's a deal breaker, and, uh, but, because it causes more harm, but that's about it. Don't cheat yourself. There are seven pages of direction. Never make an amends without talking to somebody. The tenth step is to, the continuation of four through nine. Oh, my God, the tenth step. So many people, like myself, think the tenth step's the evening review. Repeat after me. 
The tenth step is not the evening review. Not the evening review. Oh my God, we cannot screw up these simple twelve step programs on my watch. <laughs> and we are doing it. I swear, how many meetings do you go to? People go, I am so glad we're talking about the 10 step evening review. No, it's not. Because see, this disease, if my grandchildren have it, I want the 10 step to be a spot check inventory. I want the 11 step to be the evening review. Please, please, please. The book implies I'm going to be in trouble. It says, the deliberate manufacture of misery. God didn't do it, but if trouble comes, cheerfully capitalize on it. So he can show his omnipotence. What would happen if the next time I have a problem, I look at it cheerfully because it's going to bring me closer to my creator? Wow. What a different way to look at that. Page 19, the viewpoints and shortcomings of others is my guiding light. Shut up. (laughs) As an ex-problem drinker, my very life depends upon the constant thought of others and how I may help meet their needs. I can only do that with God's help. See, my pride's trying to kill me. It will take me drunk. If you're not in the book, please, please, please get in the book. And if you are, I'll see you on the fire lines. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.